Our company went into the woods until we were over our knees in snow which filled our boots, across frozen marshes that broke open so that icy water ran into our boots. My gloves were so wet that I could not bear them any longer. I wound a towel around my ruined hands. My face was contorted from tears, but I was already in a sort of trance. I stamped forward with closed eyes, mumbled senseless words, and thought that I was experiencing everything only in my sleep as if a dream. It was all like a madness, agony without an end. Those were the words of Harold Henry, a German soldier on the Eastern Front of the Second World War. The hellish conditions of a fierce Russian winter on underprepared Axis troops has become one of the most woefully iconic elements of that war. An impossibly large frontier of mud and ice and cutting winds to cross with ever-diminishing supplies, the threat of death by exhaustion, starvation, and exposure being ever-present even without counting the extraordinary resilience of the Soviet Red Army to contest every plodding step forward. The face of the German army on the Eastern Front was haggard. It was snow growing on an unkept beard, tears frozen beneath bloodshot eyes. Its limbs were blackened with frostbite, while the rifle it desperately clutched was unable to be fired and long out of ammunition. It was madness. It was agony without end. But the thing is, swap out that K-98 for a musket, and so much of that terrifying image remains the same. That trance, that madness which Henry describes would have been all too familiar to men like Eugene LeBaum, one of the few survivors of Napoleon's own invasion of Russia over a hundred years prior. The route was covered with soldiers who had no longer retained the human form and whom the enemy disdained to make prisoners. Every day, these miserable men made us witnesses of the most afflicting scenes. Some had lost their hearing, others their speech, and many, by excessive cold and hunger, were reduced to a state of frantic stupidity, which made them roast dead bodies for nourishment or consume their own hands and arms. There were some so weak that not being able to carry wood or roll a stone to sit upon took the dead bodies of their comrades and with a sullen countenance steadfastly looked upon the burning charcoal which no sooner expired than these livid ghosts unable to rise fell by the side of those on whom they were seated. We saw many quite mad who jumped with naked feet into the middle of our fires. Some with a convulsive laugh, threw themselves into the flames and perished while uttering dreadful cries and making terrible contortions. Freezing rain and mountains of snow, the icy, stabbing winds that hurt your face the moment they touch bare flesh. Many of us are familiar with these things, and even if you don't live in a part of the world where it happens, you've surely seen footage and read posts online about nor'easter storms and unexpected whiteouts. And at least partially because of this, I think, it's easy for us to take for granted when we read about how armies would become stalled in the snow. It's easy to get lost in the statistics and the maps and, and yes, even the paintings and to ponder with sanctimonious pity, oh, how awful it must have all been. But When we talk about armies being stuck in the snow and cut off from supplies, such simple words, we aren't talking about scraping off your car in the morning or wiggling your fingers to keep warm at a bus stop. We're talking about a kind of misery, which is for all but those who experience it firsthand nearly impossible to even begin to comprehend. It is Madness, a vision of a frozen hellscape handed down to us by the words of those like LeBaum who bore it witness. The dilapidated houses could not afford us shelter from the excessive cold. Lying on each other, suffering with hunger and chilled with cold, we heard nothing but groans. The winter was so severe that the soldiers burnt whole houses to avoid being frozen. We saw around the fires the half-consumed bodies of those unfortunate men who, having advanced too near in order to warm themselves and being too weak to recede, had become a prey to the flames. 
some unfortunates, blackened by the smoke and besmeared with the blood of the horses they had devoured, wandered like ghosts round these burning houses. They looked on the dead bodies of their companions, and too feeble to support themselves, they fell down and died in the same manner. If that doesn't sound like a scene from a horror film, then I'm not quite sure what would. And the thing is that despite the stereotype, this experience went far beyond campaigning in Russia, nor was it restricted to massive operations like Barbarossa or Napoleon's Grand Army. Those may be those two, like the, the typical examples that we hear about when it comes to the, the terror of snow and cold weather in military history, but truly all of military history is a witness to terror in some form or another. One story that we don't often hear about is the Battle of Quebec, that is Quebec City, in December of 1775. It's a part of the American War of Independence, the version that we don't tend to boast about here in the United States, but a very important part of Canadian history indeed. When American rebels under Generals Richard Montgomery and Benedict Arnold, before he turned, uh, invaded their northern neighbors in a failed bid to encourage revolt among the French-speaking populations there. By all accounts, this battle is a, is a tiny one. No more than 2,000 soldiers on either side, and little more than 100 casualties if we don't count the men who are captured as a result of the battle. Uh, and yet, this fact that it was so simple, so small, did very little to comfort the likes of Judge Henry, a rebel soldier who was taken prisoner by the British Army and who would write of the battle's frozen aftermath. On the same or the following day, we were compelled, if we would look, to a more disgusting and torturing sight. Many carrioles, repeatedly one after the other, passed our dwelling loaded with the dead, whether of the assailants or of the garrison, to a place emphatically called the Dead House. Here the bodies were heaped in monstrous piles, the horror of the sight to us southern men principally consisted in seeing our companions borne to an uncoffined and in the very clothes they had worn in battle, their limbs distorted in various directions, such as would ensue in the moment of death. Many of our friends and acquaintances were apparent. Poor Nelson lay on top of half a dozen other bodies, his arms extended beyond his head as if in the act of prayer, and one knee crooked and raised, seemingly when he last gasped in the agonies of death. A flood of tears was consequent. From what is said relative to the dead house, you might conclude that General Carleton was inhumane or hard-hearted. No such thing. In this northern latitude at this season of the year, according to my feelings, we had no thermometer, the weather was so cold as to usually be many degrees below zero. A wound, if mortal or even otherwise, cast the party wounded into the snow. If death should follow, it throws the sufferer into various attitudes which are assumed in the extreme pain accompanying death. The moment death takes place, the frost fixes to the limb in whatever situation they may then happen to be, and which cannot be reduced in decent order until they are thawed. In this state, the bodies of the slain are deposited in the dead house, hard as ice. At this season of the year, the earth is frozen from two to five feet deep, impenetrable to the best pickaxe in the hands of the stoutest men. Hence, you may perceive justification of the dead house. This particular frozen hell, it goes beyond any individual time or place. Regardless of any war's precise material circumstances, regardless of its means or its causes, this is a transcendent suffering. It's unfortunately one of many such kinds. Now, I think that that's a very powerful idea, this concept of a transcendent element to military history, something that at its core remains largely unchanged across time. Pain, loss, and trauma, these are inherent to the very nature of warfare as a form of mass organized killing. And the longer that I study military history, the more that these parallels between it all seems to appear, the more that all of it seems to rhyme. Now this video isn't sponsored, so I hope you won't mind if I take this brief moment to discuss my upcoming book project, Something Like Philosophy. And I think that if you enjoy this video and my others like it, like the mud video for example, well then this book is really going to be interesting to you. 
the premise is that of a symposium, an anthology series, where uh, different authors from different backgrounds and fields of study are all coming together to write different articles all around the same central theme of privation and suffering throughout military history. The goal is to, by the end of it, have a wide range of different topics and approaches to those topics that are all targeting the same objective to emphasize the humanity of military history, those transcendent elements of it. So for example, in this first volume, my own article is going to be about the New Orleans campaign of the War of 1812 and just how harsh all of the conditions there were, uh, whereas another is going to discuss the winter of 1854 during the Crimean War rather appropriate to this video's topic, uh, as is another article which is going to be about the Arctic convoys of World War II, and that was a real frozen hellscape if you want to describe anything as like, as like that. Um, now as well, looking towards the future, uh, if this book does well, as it seems to be doing so far, uh, I'd really like to make it into a full series. Uh, I want to open up applications to the general public, to all of you, uh, to become writers for future books, and hopefully the subjects will uh, come to encompass an ever wider range. Uh, I'd love, for example, for future volumes to get more into, into ancient and medieval history. Uh, I, I would absolutely love, I really need, in fact, to hear from, uh, from veterans about their perspective and their experiences, uh, whether they were in you know, Iraq or the Falklands or Vietnam and anything in between or beyond. Uh, and of course, future volumes will absolutely need to examine the impact of military activities on civilian populations just as much as the military itself. Uh, but again, all of that is for the future. We're not quite there yet. Uh, I'm still working on, you know, getting this off the ground, on, on bringing together enough funding to actually pay the authors for volume one who are contributing their work to it. Um, so if this all sounds like the kind of project that you would enjoy, if, if it sounds like the kind of project that you think is, dare I say, you know, important or, or, or that it'd be worthwhile in some way, well then, I would please uh, invite you to consider uh, pre-ordering a copy of Something Like Philosophy being a symposium of military privation and suffering by following the link in the description down below. All of the pre-orders of the book come with free shipping, but they are also limited in number and I'm happy to see they are going fairly quickly. Uh, already about half of them are gone, and when they are gone, the final release of the book is going to be slightly more expensive than the pre-orders are, are now. Uh, like I said, if you're enjoying this video, uh, if you liked my video about mud in military history, for example, uh, then this book is going to be perfect for you, right up your alley. Um, and also, just to throw it in there at the end, 10% um, of all of the profits from this project will be going to charity, so there's that too. Um, but for now, I, I think that I've advertised enough to you all. Thank you very much for your time, and let's return to our subject. If the accounts I've read to you thus far are able to demonstrate anything, surely it's that extreme cold can be a terrible thing for an army left exposed to it. Even if some of the accounts are exaggerated, either purposely for effect, or owing simply to the corruption of memory over time, they show very clearly the misery which these men associated with cold. However, the accounts have also been limited to exactly the kinds of climates we'd expect. Everyone knows the folly of a land war in Asia, and it isn't like Quebec has a reputation for a Mediterranean climate. But even in many parts of the world that we'd traditionally associate with much warmer weather, these exact same issues could occur. When you combine something as simple as winter weather, even when it's more mild, with other forms of privation, such as hunger or fatigue owing, in the next example, to a desperate retreat, you could face many of the same results. Cold weather, in this case, becomes not only a source of misery itself, but an amplifier thereof. Even if it isn't severe enough to be bad on its own, it will take a bad situation and make it much worse. For example, we don't often associate the Peninsular War with such horrors as a Russian winter, yet this fact proved no comfort to men such as Rifleman Benjamin Harris, as they were caught out in a desperate retreat through northern Spain. We were now upon the mountains. The night was bitter cold and the snow falling fast. As day broke, I remember hearing Lieutenant Hill to another officer, who, by the way, afterwards 
sank down and died. This is New Year's Day, and I think if we live to see another, we shall not easily forget it. The mountains were now becoming more wild-looking and steep as we proceeded. After the snow commenced, the hills became so slippery, being in many parts covered with ice, that several of our men frequently slipped and fell, and being unable to rise, gave themselves up to despair and died. There was now no endeavor to assist one another after a fall. It was every one for himself, and God for us all. Towards the dusk of the evening of this day, I remember passing a man and woman lying clasped in each other's arms and dying in the snow. I knew them both, but it was impossible to help them. They belonged to the rifles and were man and wife. The man's name was Joseph Sitdown. During this retreat, as he was not in good health previously, himself and wife had been allowed to get on in the best way they could in the front. They had, however, now given in. And the last we ever saw of poor Sitdown and his wife was on that night lying, perishing in each other's arms in the snow. Even when armies weren't in dire straits, the cold and wet could prove absolutely miserable and even dangerous to them. And soldiers would often write of winter conditions in attitudes of misery and indeed of horror whenever they were met with them unprepared or underprepared. Uh, for example, here's another account from the Peninsular War, this time from a soldier of the 71st Regiment of Foot. Unlike Rifleman Harris, he isn't writing about a desperate retreat, he's just writing about a time when his regiment was occupying some heights. And when he received those orders to occupy some heights, he wrote that we were glad, thinking the work would not be so severe. Yet he was disappointed when the men were worked constantly between guard and fatigue duties, to say nothing of the inclement weather. The weather was dreadful. We had always either snow or hail, the, the hail often as large as nuts. We were forced to put our knapsacks on our heads to protect us from its violence. The mules at these times used to run crying up and down, hurt by the stones. The frost was most severe, accompanied by high winds. Often for whole days and nights we could not get a tent to stand. Many of us were frostbitten and others were found dead at their posts. Frequently have I been awakened through the night by the sobs of those around me in the tent, more especially by the young soldiers who had not been long from their mother's firesides. They often spent the darkness of the night in tears. The weather was so dreadful, the 92nd Regiment got gray trousers served out to them. They could not live with their kilts. The cold would have killed them. There's an idea that certain armies, certain nations, certain even peoples are more capable of dealing with certain negative elements than others, not only owing to their being better prepared for them at a logistical and strategic level, but also on the part of the individual soldiers, who are, in some situations at least, perhaps more accustomed to extreme cold. If you were to expect any army to be able to deal with extreme winter conditions as par the course, the Russians are probably among the first to come to mind for fairly obvious reasons. But even when an army is prepared logistically and otherwise, even when a peoples are accustomed to harsh winter conditions even on the home front, it's entirely possible for them to still be caught off guard. Sometimes as a result of enemy action or accidents or any number of the million different factors which all play into the progression of a campaign. It is impossible to account for every element. Indeed, as the Russian army would discover in 1877 as they were fighting the Turks in the Balkans. Now, the following account comes from the book The Russo-Turkish War, published right after the fact in 1878. Uh, so, again, I think that a, a healthy dose of salt is required here, but the basic principles behind these words will stand. The snow began to fall and did not cease for seven days. All Bulgaria was soon buried under a shroud three feet thick. The thermometer in the Balkans fell to 20 degrees below zero. There were as many as 150 cases of frostbite a day in the Turkish army at Arab Kanak, and in a march which we shall describe further on, 800 Russians were either frozen to death or disabled. The Danube began to fill with floating ice, and it was necessary to remove the bridges of boats. At Brela, where this operation was not carried out in time, the bridge was broken down, and 24 pontoons were carried away by the current. The excessive cold and snow, however, were not the principal obstacle which retarded the march of the Russian columns. The Tsar had remarked, when someone sought to frighten him with the prospect of a winter campaign, Summer is the ally of the Turks. 
winter that of the Russians. The Russians were indeed familiar with the various phenomena which accompany winter, but there was one peculiar to the lower Danube with which they were not acquainted. The hurricane of snow which the Romanians and Bulgarians call the Krivitsa. This storm usually rages two or three days, and sometimes with such terrific violence that no one dares to stir out. It uproots the strongest trees and even carries off the roofs of houses, while every one outside runs the risk of being buried under the snow. The trains are compelled to cease running while the tempest lasts, and warned of its approach, the people make preparations as if for a week's siege, for although the Krivitsa only lasts three days, at least three more are needed to reopen communications with the outside world. Uh, now, I do need to interrupt the account here just to add some more context. I did a little digging for this word, krivitsa, that the author uses, and to be frank, I couldn't find anything whatsoever. Uh, I asked a few Russian speakers that I know, so that, that, that's as close as I could get to Romanian or other Balkan languages, um, and likewise, they had no idea. Uh, and ultimately, I turned to all of you, actually, and then I was actually really pleasantly surprised to see that uh, not only, I suppose, do I seem to have a significant number of viewers from that part of the world, uh, but there was, in fact, an answer to be had. Um, if anyone has additional context or even a disagreement on this translation, uh, please do leave a comment. Um, I'll be sure to, you know, uh, leave a comment myself that I can pin uh, if there are more details provided. Uh, but in any case, it does seem like the word the author intended to use here would be this one. I think it's pronounced as krivats, something like that. Um, and it refers to a specific wind that comes from the northeast and is particularly brutal, bringing extremely low temperatures temperatures and, and, yes, brutal winds, hurricane-like conditions. Uh, so, in all likelihood, that's what the author is referring to here. Um, I'm not going to uh, correct the account moving forward. I, I like to keep the original language wherever possible. Uh, but just keep in mind that if you want to read more on this subject yourself, uh, that is going to be the word that you're looking for, not the one that the original author is using here. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's able to comment and help me out on this point. Um, but in any case, we'll carry on with the account now. The Russians paid little attention to the warnings they received, thinking that the Krivitsa would be no more terrible than the snows of their own country, but they were soon undeceived. In the latter part of December, a series of disasters occurred through this unexpected foe. A convoy of wounded, surprised by one of the tempests, was unable to advance in spite of the utmost efforts of horses and men. The ambulance carts were overthrown one after another, and the snow accumulated incessantly until the whole column was overwhelmed by it. Few escaped to tell the tale. Near Karachany, a whole camp was buried under the snow, and thousands of soldiers had to be set to work to dig out their comrades, several of whom were found to have perished. A convoy of provisions on its way from Sistova to Bikla was overtaken by the Krivitsa, which completely prevented its further progress. The number of horses and cattle lost by the Russians during the days which the tempest lasted amounted to several thousands. At Shipka, as might be expected, the storm raged with the greatest violence. No one could face it. The Russian outposts were withdrawn and sheltered in rude huts made of the trunks of trees, some of which, however, succumbed to the fury of the storm, and the soldiers narrowly escaped death. For two days, the snow fell so heavily that it was impossible to distinguish a man at fifteen paces. So great was the force of the storm that the solidly built barracks of the troops trembled to their foundations. The Turks also withdrew their outposts, but not before several men had been frozen to death in the trenches. There reaches a point in every military campaign, regardless of where or when it is, when in some fashion or another you simply cannot plan any more. Even a near-perfect campaign will face problems, and more often than not, those problems, whether they're logistical or strategic or whatever, they don't just affect a map. They reflect a very real, very immediate, and a physical reality for the people on the ground. In earlier days, it could sometimes get so cold, even unexpectedly, that pack animals and horses and the like would simply freeze to death, it being practically impossible to save them when so many resources were already being dedicated to keeping the men themselves alive. And that, very clearly, is more than just a logistical problem. And even in our modern era of mechanized warfare, the equivalent problem 
well, it may not be quite so immediately disturbing, but it's equally going to reflect that same struggle of humanity, thrust into already inconceivable privations, that of warfare, to resist something so omnipresent as the elements themselves. As, for example, ambulance driver Antonia Gamwell would discover during the First World War, merely trying to keep her equipment functioning at its most basic level could prove not only tiresome, but, well, very difficult. Of course, in the winter, it was bitter, and we couldn't keep the uh, cars mobile. I mean, they just froze, of course, if they were left to freeze, but we had to keep winding them up every, we tried every other way, we tried putting hot bottles in the engines and uh, under the bonnets, when heavy bonnet covers and every device we could possibly um, imagine, but it was no use and we had to uh, simply stay up. There were details. So many of us, six I think it was, used to uh, be on duty and every 20 minutes we went and, and wound up the whole lot. And of course, winter on the Western Front of World War I may as well have been a summer in the Caribbean when compared to the Eastern Front of the Second War. There, this madness of cold took on whole new meanings when frozen equipment was but one of their myriad concerns, as recorded by one soldier, Siegfried Nappe. A paralyzing blast of cold hit us. Our trucks and vehicles would not start, and our horses started to die from the cold in large numbers. We all now numbly wrapped ourselves in our blankets. Everyone felt brutalized and defeated by the cold. The sun would rise late in the morning, and not one fresh footprint would be visible for as far as the human eye could see. The flesh on our faces and ears would freeze if we left it exposed for very long, and we tried to wrap anything around our heads to prevent frostbite. Our fingers froze even in gloves. They were so stiff from the cold that they refused to perform any function. We could not have fired our rifles. The thing about this kind of cold, being trapped more or less outside, exposed to the worst of the elements, is that it becomes, not to use this word twice in the same video, but it becomes omnipresent, unavoidable, inescapable. Even in relatively good situations where certain luxuries could be afforded, there's always that presence, which is going to cling to everything, making every part of life just that much more difficult. This is a sneaking form, a silent, slowly crushing kind of terror. Even luxuries, when they could be had, would bear these bitter reminders of the cold and how it just sticks to you. As NCO Clifford Lane would discover, just trying to have himself a cup of tea in the trenches of the First World War. The coldest winter was the winter of 1916-17. The winter was so cold that I felt like crying. In fact, the only time I didn't actually cry, but I, I never felt like it before, not even under shell fire. We were on the, in the Ypres salient and uh, in the front line, I can remember, we weren't allowed to have a brazier because it weren't far away from the enemy. And uh, we couldn't, therefore we couldn't brew up tea, but we used to have tea sent up to us at the communication trench. Well, a communication trench can be as much as three quarters of a mile long. And it used to start off in a huge Dixie, two men would carry it sort of with a, like a stretcher. It would start off boiling hot, by the time it got to us in the front line, there was, there was ice on the top. It was so cold. That same winter, another man, Army sapper George Clayton, would find it difficult to even keep up with basic Army regulations for shaving, which so many of us completely take for granted today. You could get a handful of snow and put it in one of them empty cups and tins, you know. We used to get tins of cups and that 60 cigarettes was just about it like a milk thing, and uh, you could warm, warm your snow in there to get water underneath a candle, then you had some warm water when the, the snow melted, have a shave, and by the time they were shaved, we used the cut throat razors, there wasn't any safeties in them days, by the time they were shaved, 
the water was frozen again to ice and you had to melt, melt the water that you left your leather bush in before you could get it out. It was a block of ice again. I've known me have to do that more than once. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you'd like to hear more recordings like those three, well, they're all pulled from the same page on the Imperial War Museum website, alongside many others, which I didn't reference here. Uh, so if you enjoy this topic, or just in general, you'd like to hear more accounts of all sorts from different subjects relating to the war, well, then that really is the place to go. It's an amazing resource. Uh, I'll have it linked in the description. Uh, but like I said, at the end of the day, those men and women had it easy when compared to certain other military campaigns throughout history. Uh, and so, what better place to end our video than where it started? With the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front, where we might finally see in the account of Guy Sayer at least one way in which men, frozen to the bone, might attempt to end their suffering. And I don't mean by urinating on the limbs of their comrades, although such did often occur, according to his account, and which often infected their wounds. Rather, an end far more brutal, and at least one might pray, final. Heads up, this next account does include a reference to suicide. We spent a fortnight in these bitter conditions, and it proved fatal for many of our group. We had two cases of pneumonia, we had frozen limbs, and a kind of gangrene from cold, which first attacks the exposed portion of the face, and then other parts of the body. Two soldiers, driven mad by despair, left the convoy one night and lost themselves in the featureless immensity of the snow. Another very young soldier called for his mother and cried for hours. Toward morning, a shot jolted us all awake. We found him a short way off, where he had tried to put an end to his nightmare. But he had bungled his effort didn't die until the afternoon. There are many sufferings in military history. Stories of privation and trauma and outright horror. But for those of us who are just reading about these historical hellscapes from the comfort of our own firesides, it's easy to take for granted what that suffering would have looked and felt like. Even to outright reject it, neglect it, in favor of its more technical consequences. To focus on, on how weakened supply lines would stall advances on the map, uh, to focus on how equipment would perform differently in different conditions. Simply put, it's easy to forget that suffering, especially when these experiences are so far removed from our own, at least I might hope that they are. It's through the primary sources, through the accounts of those who were there, that we might remember and thus gain small insights into the reality of the human condition past and present. Even when those readings are unpleasant, they're important. And even when they're from perspectives that we might find abhorrent and wrong, they're still a vital part of the overall story. If anything, that just represents an even greater part of the tragedy that's to be found in the lives of men like Klaus Hansmann, another soldier of the Third Reich, with whose poetic and thoroughly disturbing prose regarding this simple topic, seemingly simple topic, of snow and cold, I'd like to conclude this video with. He would write, That is the power of nature, when it rips at all your limbs, when you have to brace yourself not to lose your grip. You're propelled like a withered leaf. You forge on, and step by step, you press into the icy wall of snow that threatens you. Your head sunk low, a bit sideways with open mouth, snatching at breath, you carefully set one foot in front of the other. First, you take a strong step, then tense your muscle muscles powerfully, and you notice that slowly your body moves forward, so that you fight against the elements, a small, tiny man, all alone. You go on, always forward. Forward? You must have reached the house at last. You carefully raise your face against the storm, squint for a few seconds into the white force, but everything is a torrent. Everything is snow in raging movement. You are alone. Where are you? Where is the house? Thank you for your time today, my dear viewer. And until the next, I am and I shall remain 
your most humble and obedient of servants. Mm -hmm.